Hello, everybody. Welcome to the White Bear Lake Area Historical Society uh, program, What's in a Name? My name is Sarah Hansen, and I am the Executive Director of the White Bear Lake Area Historical Society. And it's my pleasure to welcome you along with um, uh, the Ramsey County Library System, which we do these programs in partnership with. So we are grateful to continue doing that and, and have the opportunity to continue doing that. Uh, this is actually a new program series for us and I have to give a shout out to Dan Jones, one of the Historical Society volunteers who encouraged us to take on this concept of what's in a name and, and how do you name um, parks and streets and things around town and, and why are they named what they are? So thank you, Dan, for that, as well as uh, some design help along the way and uh, some background research. So uh, it, it, we would be in trouble without uh, his, his nudges for this program. So it's kind of fun to be able to partner and, and do some of those things and come from a different perspective. I'd also like to introduce Rihanna O'Brien, our associate director, who is with us tonight. Uh, Rihanna will be doing the tech support side of things and, and moderating uh, questions and, and helping as we go. So a few housekeeping things uh, for those who um, are new to Zoom or I always like a little reminder, your controls are either at the top or bottom of your screen. So if you um, if they don't see them, go ahead and move your mouse or touch your screen just to get them to wake up and uh, you should be able to use, utilize the chat feature. So if you have any technical questions or are having issues hearing or other things, please use that. If you have a question about the program that you want to submit, feel free to put that in the Q&A section in the Q&A feature. Uh, we find that that's a little bit easier to organize them. We can check them off when they're answered and they don't get lost in the chat if there are a lot of comments and that sort of thing. So we appreciate that as well. And then Rihanna will help filter those forward uh, throughout the program or um, at a particularly at the end of the program. So uh, I think that is all of the official announcements to kick us off and, and uh, we'll go ahead and get going. Um, so as you can imagine, we are often asked what, uh, what's in a name? What, why are certain things named the way they are? Why are certain streets or certain um, parks or public spaces? Uh, paths and other things, and um, we don't always have the answer to that, to be honest, but uh, it's it's always fun to try to dig into it. Some of them are fairly obvious, and some are uh, far less obvious than you might think. So, uh, through for this program, we actually delved into a variety of resources to give you a little bit of background. One of our favorites are our maps, uh, and, and both uh, that we hold here at the Historical Society, as well as others that you can find online. Uh, these days, things are amazing. Uh, digitized copies of just about everything is out there from maps and, and other resources, so it's kind of fun to be able to do that. So we used a variety of those through the years, and as you can imagine, you can layer things uh, one on top of another to see what was where or how they've changed and uh, particularly with all of the lakes and water features and other areas around us, things have changed in our area. So it's, it's um, helpful to be able to do that. Uh, we also used a variety of other records and so this is kind of a combo one, but the first map of our area is was the surveyors map uh, done actually in the 1840s and then updated throughout the years. And so we actually have a, um, when the survey was done of, of Minnesota in general, or what would become Minnesota in general, we have the wonderful drawings you see here. This is just a portion of it, of course, but the wonderful drawings you see of our area here that lay out the water features, the type of landscape, the obviously the legal boundaries, the sections and the, the um, township and range and all of those things. But it also, the surveyor's notes that accompany these uh, surveys actually include the types of plants, the different types of soil, and, and all sorts of other notes and um, important information. So you find things like birch, um, clusters of birch trees. And it's no surprise that Birch Lake would have clusters of birch trees around, the, um, uh, around its shores. And uh, tamarack bogs and things like that um, also in that vicinity. So of course we have Tamarack Nature Center, which is aptly named for the Tamarack bogs uh, within, its, within its boundaries. So kind of fun to see. Uh, as we go along through the years then, of course, we have, uh, we've started seeing the governmental boundaries, the counties, the townships, the cities or villages and those types of things. So in 1858, when Minnesota was formed, Wiper Township became a um, township. It was organized and you can see that um, itemized out here uh, around the space. 
The um, shaded area here in 1881, this map comes from 1882, the shaded area here is actually the uh, original village of White Bear that was platted in 1881 or incorporated, I'm sorry, incorporated in 1881. Uh, and became essentially the downtown district of, as we know it today of White Bear. You can see that. Um, it is actually outlined in pink here um, on this 1898 map to give you a better idea. And these plat maps um, are wonderful because as you can imagine, they have all sorts of, of names and uh, pieces of information to them. Interestingly, you can look around and see things like Dillon and um, Hammond and Bebo and uh, all sorts of uh, family names that you'll see and hear about tonight or in, in future programs as we go. So uh, tonight is part one uh, and so we will, I think we'll have fodder for uh, all sorts of presentations like this going forward. Um, as we went, we figured out pretty quickly that we'd need to break it down into a couple of different sections at least, and, and that is continuing to grow as we talk about all the way around the lake. Because of course, uh, the Historical Society, the White Bear Lake Area Historical Society represents all five of the municipalities that touch the shore of the lake itself. And so that gives us all kinds of things. Um, particularly when eventually get over to Matamidai, uh, the um, streets along what is today Matamidai uh, actually were completely renamed. Uh, so that's going to be an interesting one as we go through and, and get to play with those. But tonight we will stick over on this side. This is one of our favorite maps. We use this all the time. In fact, we've sold uh, reprints of this map for the past couple decades, but um, we use this map all the time because it is actually one of the few maps that shows both sides of the lake. So uh, the county line actually runs right down the seam here uh, from north to south and separates Ramsey County from Washington County. And so it's not often easy to get a map that has both sections to it. So, uh, and then the 1916 map that you see here, the portion of the 1916 map that you see here is another favorite. It is actually um, the, uh, it's, it's a plat map that is an attachment to a St. Paul plat map or a part of a Ramsey County plat probably, but uh, attached to the St. Paul section. And we find that a lot. So White Bear being, is off, it was often considered in those days, 1916, 1900, pre-1900 um, as an extension of St. Paul. And so we weren't really uh, considered our own entity. I mean, we, we legally were absolutely, and, and as a community, we absolutely were, but we sort of get lumped in with St. Paul because we are so close and we, get, we don't get the opportunity to if you have standalone maps like these, um, like some other communities further north, um, for example, further out from the metro area. So that's a little bit challenging, but this map is fantastic in the level of detail that it shows. So you'll actually see this as the base for much of our, um, many of our slides tonight as we go. So tonight we'll talk about, as I said, the uh, downtown, primarily the downtown area, uh, which you see within the rectangle, uh, as you can imagine, uh, look at the map here we have lots more territory to cover as we said but that'll give us uh, 18 different places to stop so um, it'll we'll have plenty to talk about and, and hopefully some questions and stories to share as we go so we will cover from bald eagle avenue on the west side here to uh, highway 96 essentially up on the north and then lake avenue on the east and south portion Interestingly, if you look at this chunk, particularly of the earliest section of town that was platted, uh, you'll see that the avenues are typically run north and south and are named, they're given actual names and, and are avenues. The streets typically run east and west and are numbered. So there are a couple of exceptions potentially, but uh, those are generally the idea. So. Uh, and as you can imagine, many of them will be names that are probably familiar. Well, they're certainly familiar because they are streets today, but many of them are names uh, or logical. You can probably guess why they were named what they are. Uh, but some of them are a little more surprising or a little more of a backstory. So we'll, we'll play with those a bit. Uh, here are the 18 spots we'll be stopping, if you will, along our way. Peek there, and we'll go ahead and get started. We start sort of right in the middle uh, of the map or of the section that we're talking about and, and then we'll jump to the west and work our way across. But um, 
we'll start right here with with highway 61 and um, essentially the railroad because they're sort of interchangeable it's, it's difficult to separate the two particularly in the early days uh, when white bear was just beginning to grow and just being settled, it was the railroad that ran through here. And that's what you see here, even in the 1916 map, all of these tracks and lines are actually rail lines uh, heading up and north out of town, the, um, and, and to the south out of town. The uh, railroad came to town in 1868, September 10th of 1868. The uh, Lake Superior and Mississippi Railroad celebrated its opening, uh, grand opening of the route from St. Paul to White Bear with an excursion train, a special excursion train, uh, bringing 500 people out to the lake that day to celebrate that opening. Along the route or along, uh, along with the train uh, came several dignitaries, including Alexander Ramsey, who was at that time a US Senator, but had been uh, Minnesota's governor. The uh, our, one of our members of Congress, Ignatius Donnelly, Dr. J. H. Stewart, who was then the mayor of St. Paul, Colonel Taylor, who was the superintendent of Indian Affairs, William Banning, president of the railroad, and Gates A. Johnson, who was surveyor general. They were all part of the festivities, and I'm sure that some of those names seem familiar at this point. Uh, you'll notice that they appear, of course, as street names as we go. We can't overemphasize the significance of the railroad to White Bear. We don't think of ourselves as a railroad town these days. It, it's really taken uh, a backseat, literally and figuratively, um, to the automobile and, and other methods of transportation. But the uh, railroad really is what built White Bear. So it's, it's no coincidence that when the trains came, made it, the tracks made it to White Bear in 1868, connecting us to St. Paul, uh, the resorts began to build and grow and boom. Um, and then by 1870 and 1871, we had connected all the way up to Duluth. And so we had gone from a um, connecting the, the capital city and the head of the navigable waters of the Mississippi River, all the way up to Duluth and an international seaport at Lake Superior. So that was an incredibly important uh, piece of, of opportunity really for White Bear. At one time, more than a quarter of our households within White Bear Township and later the village of White Bear were actually uh, had someone employed or were actually sustained by the railroad. So if you can imagine 25% uh, of, of your population having uh, the heads of households be um, employed by the railroad, that's a pretty significant economic impact. So um, as time went on, the railroad continued to invest. This is actually later, uh, about 1930, 32, and the railroad continued to invest. If you look along this side, on the right-hand side here in the corner, essentially of the photo, this is an aerial shot of downtown White Bear in the summer of 32. And you can actually see uh, multiple sets of tracks here. The, the trains are lined up on them. Um, this is the original 1868 depot here long depot, larger depot than what we have now, and the long shed that was um, the, the cover for passengers uh, to stand out on the platform and wait for their train to come. There actually was no official driving road through here for automobiles through this stretch. People did drive the dirt road and, and you could drive through there sort of, um, but it really wasn't a platted or planned road at that point. Uh, it was strictly for the railroad to come through. It wasn't until the mid 30s when Highway 61 was rerouted through here, or the highway was rerouted through here, and it actually ran um, essentially right through where the depot sits today. So basically this depot was taken out in the summer of 1935 and the current depot that we know um, today that where the Chamber of Commerce is housed was actually built uh, off to the side here and um, out of the way of the highway as it came through. Interestingly, so if that's the case, we say, well, how did the cars get through here? Um, again, you can see the railroad, we zoom out a, just a little bit on here and you can see a uh, bigger context, but you can see the railroad tracks as they come through the downtown area. And um, the road actually came up around the lake shore, up this way, and came up to where Lake Avenue and Highway 96 and 61 come together. And instead of continuing up like it would today, it actually went, continued along Lake Avenue, along the lake shore, and came all the way up to Stewart, where it then went, oops, I can't go straight, where it then went straight up 
to the north and out of town and connected to what we think of as Highway 61 today. Interestingly, uh, that is part of the reason why a couple of our major resorts were built right here at the edge of Stewart Avenue and Lake Avenue. Um, Stewart Avenue was constructed with concrete or cement uh, as its base and was wider than the other streets. You can see it's actually shows a little wider here um, because it was part of the highway system. It was also, Stewart Avenue is also known, we'll talk more about Stewart in a minute, but Stewart Avenue was also known as the Delwood Cutoff on several maps. And I know that that is still the case for a lot of folks as they come down 96, they'll cut along Stewart, and cut into town or, or bypass down to the, the highway there that way. So another name for Stickley when it was, or for uh, Highway 61, when it was put through White Bear, the portion that was actually put through the downtown area. Interestingly, a lot of highways uh, bypassed downtowns. And of course, that's what happened when 35B came through. Uh, they took the, the highway traffic away from the downtown in theory. But um, for us, it was the opposite. We had bypassed it um, initially going through the lake and actually that's where the people were and the population were. But as the business district grew up, along 4th Street and, and uh, Railroad Avenue and some of the others, the um, highway actually came to that area. And so the section, the new section that came through the downtown was actually named Stickley Boulevard. And it was named in honor of Warren Stickley, who was uh, the publisher of the White Bear Press at the time. Now, it's kind of a fun story. My dad grew up in town and, and around town um, in the 1930s and 40s as this was happening. And he always swore that Mr. Stickley published a survey or a, a, a put a contest, if you will, in the um, White Bear Press and wanted to have people vote on what we should name the road, the new road as it came through. And then one week he announced that unanimously Stickley Boulevard was the winner. The name was the winner and the, the chosen selected uh, option. We have the archives of the White Bear Press and I don't see anything like that. Uh, I've never been able to come across that, but it was one of his favorite stories to tell. So um, we always found it to be kind of entertaining that uh, that was part of, part of the local legend and lore. So the other end of Stickley Boulevard, this is actually the north end of town um, where you can see this is Stewart Avenue coming out to the north. And these are the lanes heading in. Um, well, actually, I believe that's Stewart Avenue. I'll have to take a closer look at that. Uh, anyway, in any event, the um, highway improvements in the 1930s were significant and really uh, created more of that driving force to bring folks into our downtown business district. The big resorts that had been out at the lakeshore and, and along, uh, along near the, where the shopping center is and that sort of thing changed. Those were no longer popular like they had been and hadn't been for a while. Uh, and things like Jansen's Motel, Motor Hotel, uh, started to pop up. And this is that where um, McDonald's and the Wiper Country Inn are today near Highway 96 East and Highway 61. The, at the other end by White Bear Avenue and Highway 61, we had the Edgewater Motel, which was a similar setup uh, by where Kowalski's is today. And the other fun thing that started to develop along Highway 61 essentially uh, is the auto strip. The actual original White Bear auto strip, we, we all know about it down on the south end of town and um, the uh, in near Maplewood and, and all of that with all of the different dealerships, large dealerships now. But the original auto strip was really between Highway 61 and Clark Avenue, um, between 2nd and 3rd Street. So if you can imagine right downtown, uh, right across from U.S. Bank there, there were um, Chevrolet dealers and Ford dealers and then all sorts of other dealerships pre the, the, of, of automobiles that no longer exist. So um, all of this was happening as, as that downtown district was being built up, which is kind of interesting and, and had a pretty big significance on us around town. The, um, the other piece that we, we often underestimate or don't think about is the significance of Highway 61 as a whole. Uh, it is important to us, it's sort of the center vein or artery of our community, but um, Highway 61 really started in Minnesota as a series of military roads in the 1850s, uh, and then they started to be paved and started to be pieced together as time went on but nearly all of them were, were gravel and dirt for many, many decades. And um, ultimately, it wasn't until the early 1920s, uh, 1921, when Minnesota followed our neighbors to the east, Wisconsin, and started to establish an actual state highway system. 
So the Minnesota Highway Department was able to start a major program of highway construction in the 20s. And so that's how, um, how that sort of started getting filled in. And, and then of course, the, at one time, it actually went from Grand Portage at the Canadian border all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico, if you can imagine. Uh, today, the Grand Portage uh, section, the, the section up here is not um, fully in place. So, but. And of course, today, as we've said, Highway 61 remains as an important piece of um, our community, an important, important artery. There were improvements made a few years ago um, construction-wise and, and widening certain sections and creating safety pieces and making them more aesthetically interesting and uh, banners and all sorts of wonderful things that were invested in to make that entry into our community a little brighter. We've gotten comments over the years um, that it's a shame that the highway separates the two sides of town and it's interesting that uh, actually the highway um, really it's not the highway's fault so much as it was the railroad before it i guess it was set up that way initially and and uh, the highway is just sort of taking the place of the railroad so um, but that is our major as i say our major artery or major piece uh, and we will now jump over to the western edge of our map or our section for tonight the uh we didn't actually include Bald Eagle Avenue, that's the boundary on the western edge here, but um, it's pretty self-explanatory. Bald Eagle Avenue is exactly what you would think it is. It is the um, road that leads to Bald Eagle Lake and dead ends into the lake itself at its southern shore. And then of course, Bald Eagle Boulevard goes around and we will talk about those at another time um, in another program a little bit more deeply, but uh, that's our, our western boundary. And then as we make our way across, we are at uh, Murray Avenue. Murray isn't a very long section of road, uh, just a few blocks as you can see, but uh, Murray Avenue is named for the Murray family, which uh, consisted of James F. Murray and his two sons, James C. Murray and John B. Murray. They came to town in the 1850s, some of the earliest settlers we had uh, who came to town and they were essentially land speculators. They invested in large tracts of land, including the area where um, the, where Murray Avenue is now held, now sits, uh, as well as basically all the land along Lake Avenue here along the lakeshore, including Manitou Island. John B. Murray, one of the sons, actually owned and, and constructed the Murray House Hotel, which sat at the corner of Stewart and Second Street and Lake Avenue. Um, or actually, I apologize, that's the Shadow Gate. The Murray House Hotel was down this way. I flipped my slide around. Um, but the Murray House Hotel was on this corner. The um, Shadow Gay sat on this corner. So there were two large hotels. And again, because of Stewart Avenue coming down and, and the uh, access to the better roads and the ice houses at the north end of Stewart and all of the other pieces, the resorts were important there. The uh, then James C. Murray, the other son, actually built a cottage or a home down here at, near the corner of Clark and Lake Avenue. He was just a couple houses in. Initially, he built a log cabin. They were here early and, and things were pretty rustic. He built a log cabin in the back of his lot. Uh, and that's where he actually started as White Bear's postmaster. He had the post office in his, in his roll top desk in his home, uh, his log cabin. And that cabin is actually the foundation or the core of a house that sits along First Street that was lit, would eventually be put in behind the, the Murray property here. Uh, interestingly, the, some of the logs are actually visible when restoration and um, construction work has been done over the years. And then in the 18, late 1880s, he decided to build a more grand home uh, on Lake Avenue. And so he built the home you see here at this spot. Murray, James C. Murray is presumably the person officially that Murray Avenue is named for. It actually, uh, Murray Avenue actually goes up into property is owned by J.C. Murray, uh, several acres owned by J.C. Murray up there. He also earned, owned this chunk down here where his cabin and his house were, as well as replatting this whole section initially uh, as Murray's addition to White Bear. James C. Murray, like I said, was postmaster. He was also the first president of the White Bear Village Council when it was organized in 1881, so effectively the mayor of the council at that time. Uh, and he served as the first station agent for the railroad when it came to town. Uh, he was also a Civil War veteran, so we see James C. Murray sitting here at the center of the group. Uh, this is F.E. Whitaker and Elsie Dunn uh, sitting with 
James Murray on top of Lookout Mountain in Chattanooga, Tennessee during their Civil War service with the Union Army. The next street over running parallel to Murray is Miller Avenue. Uh, Miller is also a, a relatively short street and kind of a fun one. Uh, this is one we actually didn't know anything about going into this program. Uh, Murray, we had a pretty good idea who Murray was and what was going on there and, and some of the others. But um, when we put out the word that we were doing this program, we received a phone call from a descendant of um, the Miller family. And the family story is kind of a fun one. So she said that Matt Murray, or Matt, I'm sorry, Matt Miller, who you see here, was uh, a janitor at the high school. He was a custodian working for the high school, which uh, was where the district center is today, just a few blocks away. And he lived at Second Street and Miller Avenue. Well, he decided that all these other streets were getting named for people in town or folks who had been in town. And he wanted to know how you get a street named for you. So you, he, he marched across the tracks and down to Clark Avenue to the village hall or city hall that stood on the corner where the Domino's Pizza is today uh, and went in and talked to the clerk and said, you know, how, do you, how does that work? How do you get a street named after you? And they said, well, you request it. He said, all right, that's what I want to do. And so forevermore, Miller Avenue was named Miller Avenue. I don't think it's quite that easy these days, so um, I don't know that it would work, but uh, kind of a fun, fun story. And like I say, one of those that we never knew for sure what the rationale was, but um, that's, that's how Miller Avenue came to be. So. The next one is uh, interestingly labeled as Oak Avenue in 1916. It's um, what we know today as Bloom Avenue. But in between, it was it was originally platted or laid out as Oak Avenue, and we'll see a few of them as we go through time named for different streets. There's Oak here, there was an Elm down here, uh, and some others that were eventually renamed by other names as time went on. But Oak Avenue runs runs fairly well up the way. Uh, it is actually, as I said, Bloom Avenue today, but in between it was named White Bear Avenue, interestingly enough. Uh, and it was actually renamed for Fred Bloom, who you see over here. Fred Bloom was a several time mayor of White Bear Lake. He actually spent almost two decades between his time, uh, or about two decades between his time serving on the council and then as mayor of White Bear Lake in the 40s and, and early 50s. And he um, lived on White Bear Avenue. His house still stands just south of the district center. And he, uh, eventually the, the street was named in his honor. So as we continue down just below, you can see that that Bloom or Oak uh, or White Bear Avenue moved to the north, almost in alignment with it to the south is a very short little street, just a couple of blocks uh, called Burson Avenue. Uh, Burson Avenue is one that we've seen the name of George Burson, who you see on the screen here several times we've seen it, he pops up in different things um and uh, actually much like the murrays if you have property if you own a home or property within this vicinity odds are if you have your abstract or your um property records any of the transactional records uh, a murray probably appears on your abstract somewhere it's not unlikely that a person appears on your abstract somewhere and probably uh, george person George Burson was actually the brother-in-law of John B. Murray. George's sister uh, married John, and um, they ended up actually, he ended up coming to White Bear with, with the Murray family. And again, they all came in the 1850s. And as of the 1860 census, uh, George Burson was listed as a farmer, but residing with the Murrays. Interestingly, by 1870, just a couple of years after the railroad came to town, he is listed as a railroad worker, but still residing with the Murrays. So he was um, around and, and close. Uh, and actually, Burson Avenue backs up directly. Um, in fact, you can see on the street sign here, it's Burson and First Street. Uh, Burson Avenue backs up directly. First Street comes across here. And the Murray house uh, and log cabin and, and then cottage would be directly to the south of that. So it makes sense that they are kind of lined up as such. The, um, as silly as it sounds, this one had me a little bit perplexed, I'll have to admit. Division Avenue seems logical, um, pretty straightforward. It's, it's probably a divider between something. 
And um, interestingly, uh, it is actually in alignment, it goes further north, but it is in alignment with the boundary. This line actually shows the boundary between the village of White Bear and White Bear Township uh, in, in those early years, the original village boundaries. So that makes sense. Um, I found it interesting that it extended further south. And then we have this little piece here, which is actually named Half Street, uh, which is interesting in its own right. The um, Half Street portion sits between 4th and 5th Street, uh, and if you're familiar with that area at all, it's a little bit twisty and turny, but it's it's actually parking lots and um, space back there that's uh, for several different businesses, so half the chunk that would have at one time been Half Street is gone, but uh, kind of interesting. So, and then again, the, the railroad with its diagonal sort of cut through here uh, shifts things a little bit, but it brings us down to, on the south end, to Clark Avenue. Uh, interestingly, Clark Avenue is one of our most significant streets in the sense of the way it was laid out and the, the plans that were made for it. Uh, we talk about Stewart being important and, and kind of a thoroughfare uh, and highway space. Clark Avenue is similar to that. It um, is actually named for Frank H. Clark, who was a Philadelphian, uh, had nothing to do with White Bear, other than the fact that he was the president of the Lake Superior and Mississippi Railroad uh, from 1864 to 1867. So as they were planning and building the line out to White Bear, uh, he, was, he was president of the Lake Superior and Mississippi Railroad. Uh, Clark's family were close friends of Jay Cook, who you'll hear about in a little bit, uh, and really provided, Clark's father provided Jay Cook with his financial start, uh, and, they, and they were close family friends. So that helped that relationship, and, and uh, there was a lot of inner workings there. Interestingly, um, Clark also married the daughter of Edmund Rice, who was the president of the Minnesota and Pacific Railroad Company, uh, and former mayor of St. Paul. U.S. Congressman, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, interestingly, Clark Avenue itself um, has not a lot of uh, connection to Clark. I mean, Clark didn't come and stay or do anything. Uh, we have heard of a couple of other Clarks who were said to have lived on the avenue, and, and sometimes local lore says it was named for them, but it came into play at the same time as the other railroad names you're going to be hearing about, so I'm pretty confident that it was named for Frank Clark at that time. Um, but Interestingly, again, as it was laid out, the avenue or the boulevard was laid out as the widest street in town. It was purposely set to be quite a, an expanse. And the view that you have is, of, is as if you were stepping off of the train at the depot and looking down toward the lake. And that was the intention. The idea was to have as, as clear of a view of the lake as possible because that was the attraction that was bringing people to town. And so they wanted that, that opportunity. Um, interestingly, along the sides of, it does, it, this was early on in this photo, so it's not um, too populated yet, although there are some structures, but uh, you see here at 3rd and Clark, you see the Getty Building, which is um, still there today in this form. Uh, the Getty Building held the White Bear Mercantile, the Post Office, the uh, uh, White Bear Press Office, the library at different times, and even the Village Hall before a Village Hall building was built. Um, meetings were actually held in the Getty Building or Getty Hall. On the other side, we have um, what was the Long Hotel at one point, uh, the Mercantile Barn, and then the first Methodist Church, which is now the Christian Science Church along Clark Avenue, uh, but was built as the first Methodist Church. And then as you, if you could continue down and sort of see as you go, there was the uh, City Hall or Village Hall eventually, and then City Hall um, and Jail and Fire Station, where the Domino's Pizza building would later be. And on this side, the library structure, and eventually, of course, the Episcopal Church, and just around the corner would have been the Presbyterian Church. So this was sort of the, the thoroughfare um, of, of the, the kind of the place to be, our main street, if you will, and, and where we were showing off, putting our best foot forward. The uh, idea of filling it in and creating boulevards to it didn't come until about 1910. And interestingly, as we were doing research, Rihanna came across an article that talked about Clark Avenue, the, the, um, the village council wanting Clark Avenue to be another Summit Avenue, another laid out like Summit Avenue with the boulevards and the, the um, drives. 
And so I found it sort of ironic that, uh, or kind of entertaining that uh, they actually hired in 1910 and 11, they hired a very young Holman Olson company to come in and do the landscaping and lay out the boulevard. And Holman Olson was known as the florist for Summit Avenue. So they were very specifically attempting to mimic that uh, sort of appeal and with the lights and the, the uh, statues and the landscaping as they went along. So kind of an interesting piece. As we continue on, you'll see in 1916 uh, in this map, uh, the road here is Railroad Avenue, but you'll see the street signs say both Washington Avenue and Washington Square. If you are at the fourth street end, it is now today known as Washington Avenue. If you were at the third street end, it is known as Washington Square. And actually, uh, interestingly, the, there are a number of, of things like that that sort of um, got changed over time and sort of evolved over time. But uh, Washington Square is what many call it today. It was originally known as Railroad Avenue uh, for obvious reasons. It was adjacent, immediately adjacent to the railroad station and to the Railroad Park, which is the area um, where the band shell is and uh, where a lot of festivities take place, particularly well, in winter too, I guess, but particularly in the summer months. Uh, but in 1932, the White Bear chapter of the DAR requested that the, they petitioned the village council or the city council and asked them to rename Railroad Avenue to Washington Avenue in honor of George Washington's 200th birthday. So uh, as you continue on to the north, in particular, I believe it is listed as Washington Avenue across the highway as well. Um, specifically Avenue. Now, interestingly, when I was a kid uh, growing up in White Bear, Clark Avenue was always referred to as Clark Street. And again, they, the avenues typically run north and south, so it would make sense that it was an avenue, but it was uh, often referred to as Clark Street. And um, when I started working with the Historical Society, I remember uh, one day they were changing out the street signs. They were literally putting up new street signs at that time around 2001. And I came to a stop, I was driving around and I came to a stop at 2nd and Clark and it said Clark Avenue. And I thought, that's weird. It's always been Clark Street. Uh, and I drove down, I was continuing on and I drove down to the corner of Lake Avenue and Clark and there the old sign said Clark Street. So I don't know um, which one it was technically supposed to be, although on most of the maps it shows up as Avenue. So somewhere along the way that got goofed up early on uh, and had to be remedied apparently. So Long Avenue is one of our spots here. Um, it doesn't even show up particularly as a street on this early map, but this is where it, it sits today. Uh, long Avenue is one of those that could just be because it's a nice long stretch. Maybe it goes from here to Hugo or something and, and it's a nice long road. Uh, it is not actually because of the description of the road. It is named after the Long family. Uh, the Long family had a significant amount of land on the northwest side of town and um, farmed that area for many, many years. The uh, family actually appears uh, for the first time in the census data in 1865. They uh, settled first in Centerville and then made their way south to White Bear. And Jacob Long, actually, the, the patriarch of the family, if you will, is the earliest burial at Union Cemetery off of Highway 96 um, that was not a member of the Weber family. The cemetery was designed or built from the, the Weber farm um, and, and mainly because there were several members of the Weber family who had been buried there and then they turned it slowly turned into a cemetery. But Jacob Long was the first non-family member to be buried there in 1862. So their time, their connections to White Bear go back many, many years. Uh, but like I say, they first initially settled in Centerville and then made their way down this way. Um, as time went on, their property was actually divided out um, to different members of the family. We have Edward Long with 20 acres and Lando Long here with a smaller lot. Um, as you can see, as early as 1874, uh, just south of the southern shore of Bald Eagle here, uh, we have E. Long um, and Mary Long. Uh, listed as well. So by 1916, they're starting to subdivide as the family grows and, and uh, stretches out and makes their way through. So it's the Long family. Interestingly, the uh, 
area, Long Avenue um, is the address for the new Wiper Center for the Arts building, or not so new anymore, but um, newer, and the Hannaful Performing Arts Center. And uh, so the Arts District that we have today is, is on land that was essentially initially those that early farm, long farmland, as well as the, uh, what is our North Campus today was part of the long farm. So they have a, lots of public spaces that people are using and, and uh, enjoying. Oops, I need to jump ahead. So our next street is Banning Avenue. We're back to the railroad folks. Uh, William Banning was also born in Philadelphia, was a Phil Philadelphian. Uh, interestingly, his, his claim to fame or his tie to the railroad here is that he was a key lobbyist for the railroad expansion and securing the finance, financing for the Lake Superior Mississippi Railroad and getting it built in Minnesota as opposed to in Wisconsin. Um, he really pushed to have it in Minnesota. He served as president of the Lake Superior Mississippi Railroad uh, when the railway reached White Bear in 1868, and he was part of that excursion party as well. Um, he had actually come to St. Paul from Philadelphia in the 1850s, uh, and like many of his contemporaries, he served in the Minnesota House of Representatives. Uh, he's what did serve in the Union Army during the Civil War, and he was a candidate for governor against John S. Pillsbury in 1877. Banning is probably one of the more common names you'll hear associated with the railroad around Minnesota. Uh, of course, there is Banning State Park up by Duluth, and actually uh, he has a city, the city of Banning, named after him. Um, and up next, we have Jay Cook for Cook Avenue. And again, many of you probably have heard of Jay Cook. He's probably the most popular one or most familiar one. Uh, Jay Cook, um, was also a Philadelphian, same same time frame, same uh, area. He was a lifelong Philadelphian, uh, and he provided money to finance the construction of the railroad from St. Paul to Duluth. He was effectively the owner of the Lake Superior Mississippi Railroad when it was put in. He helped finance the Union War effort um, and, and essentially became, he's acknowledged as the first major investment banker in the United States. After the war was over, he decided uh, that railroads were the place to be. Railroad development in the Northwest in particular was a good financial investment. And so he started doing just that. Uh, he visited the state several times and fell in love with Duluth. In fact, he's noted as saying that he wanted to make Duluth uh, successful. He wanted it to become the new Chicago with its port to the world. Interestingly, there is both a Cook Street and a J Street in Duluth, as well as, of course, J Cook State Park, which is just south of Duluth. Now, you'll note that our Cook is C-O-O-K. Uh, J Cook spelt his name with an E at the end. Uh, somehow we dropped the E, and, and uh, I believe that is the way it has been from the beginning in our signs. But uh, So we weren't super great on the spelling of things, but uh, we captured captured the concept at least as we went along. Next up is Dr. Jacob H. Stewart, a little more local. Uh, he was born in New York, but came to St. Paul and stayed there. He really didn't have a direct connection to White Bear so much, but certainly is incredibly active in St. Paul and Ramsey County. Uh, he was the mayor of St. Paul when the railroad came to town in 1868. And so he was another one on that excursion, uh, but he had come to St. Paul in 1855. By 1856, he was the Ramsey County Medical Officer. He was a uh, Minnesota Surgeon General for a half dozen years. He served on the State Board of Education. He was a Minnesota State Senator, a Union Army Surgeon for the 1st Minnesota Regiment in 1861, Postmaster of St. Paul from 1865 to 1870, three different terms as mayor, um, and they kind of went back and forth over the years. They'd flip mayors back and forth, um, but it, so it was fairly common to have repeat um, folks come back in. Uh, and he was also the Surveyor General of Minnesota and served in the U.S. House of Representatives. There, in addition to our Stewart Avenue, there is actually a Stewart Avenue in St. Paul named for him as well. Um, and one of the fun things that uh, folks recalled about uh, Dr. Jacob Stewart is that it's, it's tough to tell in these black and white photos, but that his hair was a bright, bright red. And you can, I'm assuming that uh, it was his mustache and his beard probably were too, but the hair that he had on the top of his head, particularly in his younger years, they said was quite bright red. So he was a character in, in most descriptions. 
Again, continuing the railroad theme, uh, we have Moorhead, which is named for William Moorhead. Uh, interestingly, Moorhead was born also in Pennsylvania in a, in a town called Moorhead's Ferry. So I'm assuming a family connection there uh, and died in Philadelphia. So he was in Pennsylvania um, throughout his life. He was a director of the Lake Superior and Mississippi Railroad and the brother-in-law of Jay Cook. So there was a personal connection as well. He had an interesting history. He made his money during the 1849 California Gold Rush um, because in 1846, just a few years earlier, President James K. Polk appointed Moorhead as the U.S. Consul to Chile. With that connection in 1848, during the California Gold Rush as it began, he founded a firm to supply prospectors with food from Chile in exchange for gold. The result was one of the biggest commercial operations ever known on the Pacific Coast at that time. As many as 500,000 barrels were shipped, most of it to California, by 300 chartered ships. The firm profited $5 million in, that, in those days' money, uh, which would be about $164 million today in our money. Um, with that money, he then partnered with Jay Cook uh, and entered into the railroad um, financing business and became a director of the Lake Superior and Mississippi Railroad uh, and, and eventually served as a director of the Northern Pacific Railroad as well. Moorhead uh, is also the namesake for uh, Moorhead, Minnesota. Uh, and you'll see that the lost E that we took from Cook ended up here in our Moorhead signs. Um, unfortunately, this is another spelling error. Moorhead spelled his name M-O-O-R-H-E-A-D. So it uh, somehow got mis- translated or mistranscribed uh, as it went on, but he is represented as well. Our next street is Johnson Avenue, uh, and Johnson Avenue has the most local uh, inspiration, if you will. Gates A. Johnson, who you see in the, the clipping down below, uh, came to St. Paul, also came to St. Paul in 1855. Uh, those were hot years for the mid 1850s, were hot years for investors and folks looking to make a name for themselves. Um, before he arrived in Minnesota, he was employed by a couple of different railroads. Um, and when he came here, he was engaged as the chief engineer in the preliminary survey of the Hastings and Dakota Railroad. Uh, there's a Johnson Avenue in St. Paul. It actually um, was Johnson Avenue named for him. And then the southern portion of that became Johnson Parkway and was actually dedicated for Governor Johnson, not, not Gates Johnson in the end. Um, but uh, we have our Johnson Avenue, which is named for him. Uh, he was the surveyor of record for numerous additions to the city of St. Paul and was chief engineer of the Lake Superior Mississippi Railroad uh, when it made its run from, from St. Paul to Duluth. Interestingly, as I said, he is the, has the most local connections to White Bear because um, he actually was hired by the village of White Bear in several instances throughout his career to conduct various surveys, um, whether they were grading roads or laying out other roads. Um, and actually at one point, they hired him to investigate the lake levels uh, in 1891. So um, that's always been a hot topic and, and uh, Johnson was the one to look into that. So uh, Lake Avenue is one of my favorite ones. It's fairly obvious why uh, its name is what it is. Not too tough to figure out, but uh, of course it is adjacent to the lake and, and is the, um, the, the viewpoint uh, or whatever, maybe the point from which you can view the lake. So um, what I do find interesting about Lake Avenue, people lose sight of fairly frequently, is that yes, this portion of Lake Avenue is Lake Avenue, absolutely, and what we traditionally think of as Lake Avenue. But if you continue on to the north, onto Highway 96, that is actually considered Lake Avenue North. And if you continue to the south around Highway 61 and out toward um, Kowalski's and the shopping center there, past Tally's and all of the VFW and all of that, that is considered Lake Avenue South as well. So it's, it's not just strictly um, what's in that old white bear kind of section of town, but um, that one doesn't need a whole lot of explanation, so. So uh, now we jump into a couple of parks, actually. Uh, we've done our streets and we have a couple of parks. Interestingly, Matoska Park, or what we know as Matoska or Matoska, uh, is actually 
planted out very early. Uh, this is 1916, but it's, it's on every map we've seen um, of the village and, and of the area. Uh, and actually, it, it included the space here between um, 5th and 6th Street as well, an additional space which is, is developed as houses now um, and not considered part of the park. But initially, uh, in as early as 1899 um, up through 1910, the park was known, well, it was known very early on as um, the Village Park, strictly as the Village Park. And then it starts being called Canary Park. Uh, and, and we don't know why, um, kind of an interesting oddball thing, but it is in the official village council minutes that they are doing improvements at Canary Park near the bridge, or they are, are leasing a, the rights, or approving the rights to for a boathouse at Canary Park or those sorts of things. Uh, and then as of April of 1911, it has suddenly become Matoska or Matoska Park. Interestingly, uh, we don't know why it was changed. We of course know that uh, Matoska or Matoska means, ma Mato means bear and Ska means white. So the name makes sense. It's it's a translation from, um, or a, a derivation from the Dakota languages and uh, is appropriate and fits the area. Um, but we don't know what inspired that specific change at that time. It would have made some sense to have had that early on and and we really don't know why Canary Park was considered Canary Park. So um, that, that's one of our mysteries that we will continue on with. And further to the north uh, you see West Park. So West Park actually pulled down um, a subset here, an inset, to show uh, West Park actually sits between 10th Street and 11th Street and Lake Avenue and Johnson Avenue. Um, interestingly, uh, West Park or William West Park as it was officially named was once the site of the West family home. William West was secretary of the West Publishing Company in St. Paul and uh, kind of an interesting story. There, there were not a lot of houses and not a lot of folks who built up this way. You can see how bare, you can see these, these blocks here, for example, are buildings and structures, uh, these yellow blocks. And you can see how many spaces up here um, were missing. As you got further north, um, it was much more sparse over the years. And uh, because of that, the roads weren't improved to the same level. And so in 1908, Mr. West went to the village council and offered to actually um, grade and gravel Johnson Avenue behind his property, behind his house here. And he felt that that would make it more suitable for automobiles as well as preserve the beauty of Lake Avenue by hopefully diverting some of the traffic off of Lake Avenue and, and onto Johnson Avenue. Uh, he was denied that request. There, there was a lot of controversy over it actually because folks were concerned about one individual taking on that responsibility and, and that authority. Uh, and so he was denied that request and continued on and eventually the roads uh, did improve as time went on. But by 1927, uh, the West, well by 1920 actually, the West family had moved back to St. relocated back to St. Paul. And by 1927, according to the White Bear Press, the city of White Bear Lake is the recipient of a nice windfall. Mr. and Mrs. William West have given their beautiful Lake Avenue home with all surrounding grounds, including riparian rights to the city. This property is to be used as a public playground and bathing beach, and it will prove excellent for this purpose. The property consists of all lots between 10th and 11th streets and Lake and Johnson Avenues. The park should be named the William West Park. And as you can see by the clipping over here, uh, the park was was actually put into pretty immediate use. Uh, tennis courts were in place and and um, put in good condition and landscaping and other things. The um, house was actually torn down in 1932. There was a home on the property and it was torn down in 1932. And so the whole area could be used as a park. And then the, the riparian rights, which extended out into the lake, out into the water um, and included the lake shore, uh, it didn't actually get utilized to their fullest extent until a number of years later. It wasn't until the 1940s when uh, Fire Chief Walter Berg, who you can see here, pushed the village to actually take advantage of that opportunity and provide a public bathing beach. And so a group of volunteers went uh, door to door and sold memberships in the bathing beach so that people could, they could help um, fundraise for the cause. And then other volunteers who came down with horses and wagons and cleared all the brush and the trees and the stumps out from the lakeshore. 
and, and got it to the point where you can actually see and, and um, enjoy down there. And this was just after, after the end of World War II, and so they named it, they officially named it Memorial Beach. And it stayed Memorial Beach um, for many, many years until the 70s or 80s when it actually was adopted by the White Bear Lake Optimist Club and became Optimist Beach for a little while uh, during that time. And then um, the club dissolved and the city of White Bear Lake took back the responsibility of caring for the beach and it became uh, reverted back to Memorial Beach at that time. So it's kind of a fun piece to uh, uh, a lot of folks think that it's just a it's kind of generic West Park because it's on the west end of something or in you know, a west edge, I don't know, um, and Memorial Beach because it's a memorial to whatever um, non-specific entity and uh, it is actually a memorial for World War II. Um, so. And then our final stop is kind of a quick one, not too exciting, but it's Highway 96. Uh, as I mentioned, the Stewart Avenue connection there is known as the, uh, it's actually written on some maps as the Delwood Cutoff, um, but it is Highway 96 up on the, the north end of the lake here. Uh, it is actually 12th Street in this little chunk. So if you come up Highway 61, for example, and take a right, on 12th Street or on to 96, you're actually essentially taking a right onto 12th Street. Um, and then of course it quickly turns into the highway and comes around the top end of the lake. Uh, it is often referenced in early minutes and, and other things as the county road at the site of the old ice houses. So it had no real specific name um, other than as I say, it is also known as Lake Avenue North. Um, but it was, it was also significant because it was the Northern boundary of the village limits from those original village boundaries established in 1881. So that brings us to sort of that end of, of town. So, uh, and, and I'm happy to try to answer questions or I know we're coming up on our hour already. Um, it's amazing how fast that goes. But uh, Rihanna, do we have any any folks with questions or? I wanna give them a minute to, to sure. ask. Absolutely. Questions, but a lot of great information. Is there, um, uh, it's always entertaining and, and uh, you know, we hear stories about all these folks as time goes on uh, and over the years and, and different people pop up in different ways. And I know Rhianna and I have lots of conversations in the office about, well, did you know that so-and-so was interconnected with so-and-so? And, -so? and um, I have to admit, I, I grew up not too far from Burson Avenue as a kid and uh, I always knew that there was a guy named Burson who owned a lot of land around, but uh, until I started digging into this, had no idea that he was um, part of the Murray family or interconnected to the Murray family. And, and uh, so that was kind of a fun piece to piece together. Okay, I do have one question, and this is from Judy. Uh, when you were doing the research for this program, was there any uh, name that particularly surprised you? Um, I think the most fun one was the Matt Miller one, uh, because you think of, um, I think he was pretty proud and his family's pretty proud that, uh, you know, it, it worked out that the, the street was named after him. Um, you know, I think there was a little bit of um, the idea that the it was the big landowners or whatever, and, and uh, it didn't have to be necessarily a, a senator or a railroad executive or whatever to get things up there. Um, you know, I don't know that, I'm trying to think if there's anybody that, that really surprised me. I, I don't think so much in this batch. Um, we've done some preliminary research for the next, you know, few sections, and those, um, th there's a few coming up that were more surprising to me. This is sort of our common, you know, the names we know, I think a little bit. Uh, and, and so there's nothing too, too shocking in this one, but. Um, okay. Um, Courtney wants to know how many road crossings across the tracks were there from <laughs> west to east in White Bear downtown? <laughs> That's an excellent question. Uh, a lot. And that was a hot, hot topic. Um, it's kind of funny that you asked that. So there's actually, um, let's see if I can find a decent, um, bear with me as I flip. Actually, that one might work out okay. Um, so as you can imagine, I mean, you can, you can see just about every street here. Uh, the, the village council minutes were filled with, and the city council later were filled with um, establishing crossings, establishing crossing 
warning signals um, as, as time went on. Uh, interestingly enough, if you've ever been up here um, in, along Moorhead, and let's see if I can get the one where we don't have stuff on Moorhead, sorry, I'm not trying to make anybody dizzy or I have to go the other direction. Um, the, here we go. Uh, interestingly enough, if you go up, and it, we're not quite far enough north, but if you go up um, Moorhead, it actually dead ends. And I believe it's at 9th Street, 9th Street or 10th Street, that it dead ends um, and the road is vacated. And that's exactly why uh, the railroad couldn't have one more, there was a limit to how many crossings were allowed and they couldn't have one more crossing. And so today, the people who live on that block of Moorhead, it, you can actually turn off of 96 onto Moorhead um, and you can go one block and then you're, it's a dead end. And you can come in from the south this way and go up um, and it's a dead end and you're turned off toward the park and, and whatever. Um, so there's a block or two of Moorhead that is actually the street in front of the houses is vacated and it's just grass. It's just empty and, and um, not usable and they have to use an alley to get to and from their houses um, behind the properties. So it's kind of an interesting piece but that and that is 100% why um, because they were limited on how many and I don't remember the I'd have to look at the exact number but they it became a real big deal as you can imagine. <laughs> and the trains were a lot bigger and a lot longer and, and took a lot longer time to get through um, at that point. So. It looks like all the questions, but I, I will point out that some of the, the beards and mustaches on these guys are, are pretty impressive. <laughs> you know, in the, the um, in 18 or in 1958, when they did the centennial celebration for the state of Minnesota, the, the statehood centennial, they did a beard growing contest. And we've always joked that for something around here, we should, we should reenact that and get folks to do it. Um, so you never know, we might have to bring that back. <laughs> so, oh well. All right, well, thank you everybody. If you do have questions, feel free to um, hit, go to our website, wiperhistory.org and our contact info is on there. So feel free to give us a call or shoot an email if you think of something after the fact. Um, Otherwise, we appreciate you being here and, and so glad you were able to join us tonight. So take care. We'll see you soon. <laughs>